Hey, I am Joe Donahue. I'm the associate pastor of preaching and teaching here at Calvary. And this is my lovely bride, Christy. Hi, I'm Christy and we've been married almost 20 years and this is our story. So our love story began, I gave my life to Jesus when I was 18 years old and my wife was one of the members of the student ministry that was there. Uh, she was in the youth group. And uh, I know when Christy first saw me, she thought, man, that guy is one handsome man. Not really. Uh, we, we had a mutual friend that introduced uh, us to each other. And I remember briefly her saying, this is Joe. And I was like, hi, Joe, bye. And just ran off and, and went and played with my friend. So just a, a quick meeting. God didn't bring us together until seven years later. And uh, seven years later, she transferred to my school, my university. When I ended up at the same university, um, right when I saw him, I just remember thinking, what is going on? All of a sudden, I had these butterflies in my stomach, and I thought he was really cute, whereas before, I just thought he was Joe. And then all of a sudden, I couldn't quit thinking about him, and we went on a date, and after that, it was we were together all the time. So I asked her to marry me, and she said, I said, are you going to follow Jesus? And he said, yes. And then I said, okay, yes, let's get married. So you would think that the rest of our story would be happily ever after. We found out shortly after uh, our we were married that we were both very competitive. We were both very stubborn and we were both very resistant to change. Our conflict was getting greater and it got to where even our words, we would we would say really mean things to each other, and we got pretty mad. So she would call me an idiot, and I would call her up. As the uh, contest between us grew back and forth, as we bickered back and forth, as that went on, I began to wonder, God, did I marry the wrong person? As much as I loved her, as much as I longed to be with her, I began wondering, why can't I get along with her? One day as I was reading Ephesians 5, God took my attention off of wives submit to your husbands, and he took it to husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. And then the Spirit of the Lord took me to Philippians 2 and showed me how Jesus loved the church. And it was by giving up his rights as God and taking the nature of a servant. And I realized what God was calling me to do was to change everything about our marriage uh, by becoming a servant to my wife and beginning to serve. I noticed Joe doing things in our house or doing things for me, and there was nothing attached to it. He was genuinely doing things out of love for God and love for me with not an expectation of me to return that. And not that I wouldn't want to, but I had already felt that um, maybe what I had to say wasn't important in those first years because it, I always felt like he was trumping me. And so as I saw him, that change in his heart, him serving, serving our family, serving me, um, that, that was a changing point for our marriage, and it really spurred me on. I wanted to serve back. I wanted to even, I think the big thing is in submitting to your husband, for me submitting to him was letting him serve me, leading our family by serving, and that was a changing a turning point for our marriage. I'm going to encourage you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 is our text today. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1162 and you will find our text. That's 1162. As always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one of these. This is our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, God will change your life. Uh, I just want to say uh, thank you uh, to Calvary before we dive into the message. Thank you because uh, I got back Tuesday night from our mission trip to Mozambique and uh, got to visit a bunch of well sites. Uh, I want you to know that through Calvary's generosity these past three years, we have provided the funds for 38 freshwater wells to be built in villages that didn't have them. 
And yeah, I think that's incredible. That, that means that about 30 to 35,000 people a day are drinking water that you are providing for them, clean water, uh, where their kids aren't getting sick anymore and uh, they're a lot healthier. And so they recognize that. Everywhere we went, uh, pastors were grateful. The church members were grateful. Uh, government officials showed up to say thank you and can you please put in more wells? <laughs> I mean, that was, that was kind of their approach because they understand uh, what we're doing and how important it is. And of course, uh, out of that, uh, that work, they've started churches, uh, they've got mission points, and we had a chance to preach and share at uh, all the places we visited, and we saw about 130 people come to faith in Christ while we were there. So I just want to say thanks for letting me be a part of a church that has a vision, not just to bless the people locally, but people to the ends of the earth. Uh, I also want to take a moment and just personal privilege and say thank you uh, for prayers, for condolences. Uh, some of you know, some of you don't. My mom passed away a week ago, and uh, it was expected. It was a blessing. Uh, she was ready to meet Jesus. She was ready to go on to next. Uh, but a lot of you have expressed those thoughts and prayers, and I appreciate it uh, tremendously. So on behalf of my family, I just want to say thanks. Uh, it is a, it's a joy to know that you're being thought of and prayed for and encouraged in that way. Uh, you know, it's great to be part of a family uh, that goes way beyond your, uh, your family of origin, that is a family of faith, and I am grateful for that. So speaking of families, we are concluding our series called Created For, and today we're talking about blessing. Blessing. We were created uh, for blessing in relationships, in marriages, in families. And I don't personally know anybody who wants to be blessed less. I mean, I've never had anyone make an appointment, come into my office and go, Pastor, I got a problem. I need your help. I need less blessings in my life. Uh, I, need, I need God to just take some away because things are too good. Uh, I know people who feel guilty because they're so blessed, and that's a different uh, problem. But I don't know anyone who actually wants to be blessed less. Everyone I know wants a thriving marriage, a joyful family, happy friendships. And God actually tells us how we can have a blessed life. It really boils down to taking the Word of God and applying it to our lives so that we begin to live according to God's design, according to God's plan. And as we do that, then our lives are more blessed. Uh, and, and that's just the reality. And I know that today as we're looking at the Word of God, as I talk about the Word of God and following God's plan, that today's passage is one that a lot of people don't like. It's a passage that uh, some people consider controversial. Some people even reject it, say it shouldn't be in the Bible. Uh, but we're going to read it, and we're going to learn from God's Word uh, what His plan is. So Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to pick up in verse 15. Now, before I read it, I want you to know something about Scripture. And a lot of you probably already know this, but the words that are in there are inspired by God. Okay, here at Calvary, we believe the Bible is the inspired and errant Word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. So the words are inspired by God. Uh, but you know those chapters and verses, those were added later. This was just a letter. There was no break in it and everything. It was just one letter written from Paul to the church at Ephesus. And so those little subheadings like walk in love and wives and husbands and children and parents, those were added later by other people trying to give you a synopsis. But sometimes they're inserted in awkward places where that maybe the author wouldn't have ever said don't break that passage up. That's why I'm going to read verse 15 through the end of chapter 5. Here's what the Apostle Paul says. He says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or in any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. 
In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, before we dive into the specifics in the passage, the controversial uh, things in the passage, I want you to see the big picture. And that includes uh, the Apostle Paul's words here and elsewhere in his writings, as well as Jesus' words. And the big picture is, I want you to see the principle of reciprocity. The principle of reciprocity. Uh, throughout Scripture, this principle of reciprocity is found. And the principle is basically whatever you give out comes back to you. Okay, whatever you put into life, it comes back to you. Whatever you put into relationships comes back to you. And the Apostle Paul references it in verse 28 when he says, The man who loves his wife loves himself. The man who loves his wife loves himself. What, what he's saying? He's saying if you love your wife, that love is going to come back to you. That's reciprocity. Uh, Jesus explained it this way. He said the person who gives grace is going to receive what back? Grace. Right. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Jesus said when you're generous, then you're going to get more. He said um, give and it will be given to you. For the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So Jesus talked about this principle of reciprocity in our life. The Apostle Paul talks about it here when he says the man who loves his wife loves himself. In other words, the more you love your wife, the more love you're going to get back in return. That's reciprocity. And the Apostle Paul in Galatians 6 literally said you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. Uh, let me just read it for you. Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Paul says, do not be deceived. Don't lie to yourself. Don't fool yourself. Don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. You reap what you sow. Now, a lot of people take this concept and they mislabel it. They, you know what they call it? They call it karma. You ever heard people say, oh, karma. Yeah, that's karma. That's kar no, that is not karma. Now, just for the record, I think karma is crap. Okay. Spell it with a K, explain to the kids why that's all right. But, uh, but it is. Karma is literally a Hindu concept about uh, however you live this life, you're going to be impacted in the next life. Because they believe in reincarnation. They believe you keep coming back. So if you're really a mean, ugly, nasty person, next life you'll come back as a worm. Okay? That's just how karma, that's, that's karma. What most people reference as karma is... Uh, this biblical principle of reciprocity, that you reap what you sow. And we as Christians don't believe in karma because we don't believe in reincarnation because the Bible says it is, uh, it is given unto man once to die and then to face judgment. Now, if you know Jesus, judgment is not scary. If you don't know Jesus, you ought to be terrified of it. That's why we preach what we preach. Right? We want you to know the, the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, because he will change your destiny. Uh, and so biblical reciprocity is what we're talking about, this principle that you reap what you sow. And when you grasp this principle, it changes our approach to pretty much everything. When I say grasp, I don't mean understand it intellectually. I mean you start living it in your life. And it changes your life and it changes your relationship. You heard Pastor Joe's testimony when he said, hey, I came to the realization that I needed to serve my wife and I started serving my wife. And, and you heard Christy describe how it changed the dynamic of the relationship and it changed the way she wanted to react. That's the principle of reciprocity at work. When you trust God enough to love your spouse and forgive your spouse and be kind to your spouse. So when you apply this to the relationship that you're in, everything improves. So that's, you reap what you sow. That's reciprocity. So in that light of reciprocity, let's look at the uncomfortable commands that we just read about in this passage. Now, I know some people really hate this passage. Really strong feelings against it. I know some people who like this passage way too much. Okay? I think both of them don't really understand it. 
Uh, so what I want us to do is look at this in its totality. Uncomfortable commands begin with the command to all. The command to all. Verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Uh, submission is central to all followers of Christ. In fact, you can't, sub you can't follow Jesus unless you submit to Jesus. So I want you to understand this. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world. And you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sin. That he was raised from the dead and you made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life. Understand that you surrendered to Jesus when you made that commitment. You said, Jesus, you are now my Lord. Right? If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Well, when you confess Jesus is Lord, what you're saying is, hey, Jesus, you're in charge of my life now. You're the king. You're the boss. You're the master. And therefore, I live my life according to what Jesus wants. I submit to Jesus. Now, if you're sitting here and you think, well, I'm a Christian, but I've never really surrendered to Jesus, you're not a Christian. That this journey begins when you surrender, when you submit to Jesus. That's how we get started on this journey. And so if you've been going to church your whole life, but you know I've never really surrendered to Jesus, you need to surrender to Jesus today. You can do it right now. You can come see us after the service and tell us, hey, I figured this out. I surrendered to Jesus. I'm going to live my life his way from now on. He's my Lord. But if you've surrendered to Jesus, Jesus is in charge of your life. And uh, so I submit to Jesus and then... Paul, who was a servant of Jesus, says that I also submit to other believers. Submit to one another out of reverence for Jesus. That means I receive instruction and counsel and rebuke from other believers. That means I accept help and encouragement and correction from other believers. That means that I embrace accountability as part of the body of Christ. Can I just be really blunt? You know why we want everyone in a life group? Because that's where this really happens in relationships. Because when you're just like showing up at church and you're not in relationship with other believers, there's not a whole lot of that whole submission possible. But when you're in a group and people know you and, and, and love you, then you share life together and, and it changes that dynamic because there is accountability and people are offering you help and correction. And yes, as senior pastor, I submit to other believers. All the pastors of the church, we meet together and we're accountable to each other. We pray for each other and, and we're transparent with each other. But also as lead pastor, I also submit to the personnel team that's elected by the church. And I'm responsible to them for my professional conduct. And, and then I submit to the executive council of Calvary, again, elected by the church so for my professional conduct. And our deacons of the church, I submit to them at every point. They, they can ask any question they want of my life. Because it's healthy for us to submit first to Jesus and then to the body of Christ. And we need to understand that submission isn't a bad word. Because I know some of the guys sitting here right now are going, yeah, submission, that's the S word. Not going to use it. But we need to. It's, it's essential to our identity as followers of Jesus. And when you understand this, then the rest of this passage is not so frightening or disturbing. So first... We, is the command to everyone. And then there's the command to wives. Verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now I know some of you ladies right now, just tensed up. You don't like that verse. You wish it wasn't there. But I want you to notice a couple of things. First thing I want you to notice, and this is for everybody in the room, who is this command given to? Okay, one person got the answer right. One person's at wives. Yeah, it's written there. It's the first word of verse 22, wives. Okay, this command is given to married ladies who follow Jesus. That, that's who it's directed at. That's who it's for. It invites married ladies to trust God and not only submit to Jesus and also submit to the body, other believers, but also to submit to her own husband. It's given to married women who follow Jesus. I'm saying that for a point because the point is this. Guys, 
if a man tries to use this verse to control, demand, or force a woman to do anything, put her in her place, whatever, uh, I just want you to understand he is not only not representing Jesus, he's abusing Scripture, and he's being anti-Christ. Is that strong enough language? Okay? If a guy tries to use this verse, he is abusing Scripture, and he's being anti-Christ. Because it's not for us, gentlemen. I mean, it's for... Who is it for? Again, who's it addressed to? Wives. Wives. So guys, if, if you think that applies to you, then you've got an identity crisis. Okay, and we need to talk. So it, it, you don't have anything to do with this verse. It's, it's obviously Jesus is talking to wives and you're not one, so just take a pass on it. Hands off. It's not for you. It's not for you to use. It's not for you to point out. It's not for you to hold up. It's not for you to try to uh, turn into a baseball bat. None of that is appropriate. This is for the ladies who love Jesus. First of all, understand who it's for. Secondly, this verse only makes sense if you believe God has a design for this world and his design works best. Okay? In other words, it's for married women who are committed Jesus followers. This verse is not for the population at large. It's not for unbelievers. It only works in the context of faith. It only works in the context of people who say, hey, Jesus is our Lord and we're living by his word. That's the context that it works in. So as far as a, a general societal rule, it doesn't really apply. It applies to us who say Jesus is Lord and his word is true. And, and, and by the way, that's kind of why it's important to listen to biblical boundaries when it comes to marriage. I don't know if you understand the biblical boundaries. First of all, the Bible assumes that you're going to marry someone of the opposite gender. That's why it talks about husbands and wives. And then secondly, uh, it states very clearly the one clear boundary for marriage is that you marry another believer. Somebody who's committed to Jesus as you are. Because in that case, and you heard, I love Christy's answer when Joe asked to marry her. Did you, did you catch that? When she said, are you going to follow Jesus? Because <laughs> that's the important thing. That's the important thing because it only works when, when you both submit to Jesus and you both submit to other believers. Then, as a married Christian woman, you're challenged by God to trust him and submit to your husband. Not submit as a child or submit as a slave, but as a part of a team that recognizes the husband as the spiritual leader of the family. So there's the command to everyone Submit to one another. Command to wives. And then there's the command to husbands. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, love your wives as Jesus loved the church. Do you understand the Apostle Paul sets the standard incredibly high for us? Crazy high for us. It's to love our wives as Jesus loves the church. I mean, that's the example. That's the model. You guys feeling the pressure yet? Because it's kind of a big deal. So that means that we love with gentleness. Never demanding, never forcing, never threatening. We love gently. It means we love with patience. That we lead patiently. That we control our temper. Proverbs 25, 28 says, like a city that's been broken into and left without walls is a man without self-control. Uh, in the ancient time, if your city didn't have walls, guess what it was? Unsafe. Unsafe. Guys, do you realize that if you lose your temper all the time that you are being unsafe for your family? That, that's not Jesus. Jesus loved patiently, gently. Jesus loved sacrificially. In other words, it's putting your wife's needs above your own needs. And every one of us is tempted to be selfish. Let's just go ahead and acknowledge it. We all come home. We're all tired. We're all worn out. We've had a busy day. We want to decompress. We want to just, but, but we're all tempted to be selfish. And yet Jesus challenges us men to put our wives' needs above our own. That's loving sacrificially, saying that you will do whatever it takes to rescue her and protect her and promote her well-being. Again, this is God's design. And men, God has designated us as the leaders, so that means we go 
first. Because I, I know what deals we're making in our head. Because I've been there. I will if she will. You know, hey, let's agree on this. You know, again, I'm just going to point to the Donahue's testimony. Joe just said, hey, I didn't go to Christy and say, hey, let's change this. He just changed it. He repented. He started serving his wife. And God redeemed the marriage. It's about us leading. And here's the thing. Guys, if we love our wives as Christ loved the church, do you know what her response is going to be? You know what our wife's response is going to be? She will trust you enough to follow your lead. That's biblical submission. That's really what biblical submission is. Trusting enough to follow your lead. But you've got to be leading the right direction. Understand, all this is not about power. It's not about control. It's not about dominance. It's not about winning. Because if you win and your spouse loses, you both lose. This is about loving each other in a way that blesses each other incredibly. Because the man who loves his wife loves himself. So let's look at the principle of blessing. Principle of blessing. I'm going to get really practical here because Paul is, is really practical here. Verse 33, he says, However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Again, he's, he's going back to that reciprocity. Love your wife as you love yourself. Okay? So you love your wife. It's going to come back on you. You're going to get blessed. She's going to get blessed. And you're going to live in blessing if you do this. So let me just ask you, do you want to be blessed in your relationships? Can I just commend you guys? Because you guys answered better than any other service. All the rest of them were like, are we supposed to answer out loud? So thank you. I'm glad you guys want to be blessed in your relationship. So I'm going to get really practical here. I want to talk about three patterns to practice that will bless your spouse and therefore will bless you. Now, I say three patterns. These are not things that you do once. These are things that you build into your life over and over and over again. And the more you build them into your life, the, the more blessed you're going to be. And the more you're going to bless your spouse. And as the more you bless your spouse, reciprocity is going to come back on you. And you're going to live in those blessings. Okay, so these three actions. First one is this. Words of kindness. Words of kindness. You want to be blessed? You need to learn to, to speak words of kindness. Because love is patient and love is kind. It is. So here's a question. Uh, it may haunt you uh, the rest of this week. I don't know. Hopefully. If people listened into your conversations with your spouse, and by the way, if you have kids, they do. Right? Kids are listening. I mean, they don't listen to you when you're talking to them, but if you turn up the TV, leave the room, go in the other room and whisper, they will hear it. <laughs> they know what's going on. They know. So if people listen to your conversations with your spouse, would they say... You're kind. Would they say you're kind? Again, Joe and Christy confessed they were mean to each other. They were nasty to each other. What would people say about yours? And, and you may not know right now. You may go, oh, I think I'm kind. You may need to ask your spouse. And you guys may need to have a conversation as a couple about how do we talk to each other. Maybe ask some friends that you hang out with. Are we kind to each other or not? And And... Maybe you need to decide we need to change the way we talk towards each other. One of you can start it, but if both of you agree, it, it changes that dynamic. Because the, the problem is the person we're supposed to love the most often becomes the person we're the cruelest towards with our words. It just happens so naturally. But if your words are destroying your spouse, you're not loving your spouse. And if you're not loving your spouse, then you're not blessing yourself. Words of kindness. The Apostle Paul, uh, in the previous chapter in Ephesians, says, Let no unwholesome words come out of your mouth, but only that which builds up those who hear it, that it may benefit those who listen. No unwholesome words. Period. It's a high standard. That's the one he sets for us. Proverbs 12, 18, my favorite proverb. Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Are you cutting your spouse to pieces or are you the one who's healing them um, words of kindness are necessary if you're going to have a healthy relationship that blesses you and blesses your spouse so it begins with words of kindness and then we need acts of service we need to love in word and in deed uh, there's some people who talk a great game never follow through don't they frustrate you 
I, I hope that, that isn't you. Uh, but, it, you know, there's that problem in Scripture. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but don't do what I say? We need to love in word and in deed. Uh, and we're called to be servants of Christ. You know, that was, that's part of our identity, right? Jesus said, if any of you want to be great, they must become the servant of everyone. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So it's about serving. And, and, and we as a church try to do that. Okay, understand, we try to represent Jesus by serving our community. So that's why this next Saturday, serve our schools. By the way, we still need about, you know, 100 volunteers to help us do that. Because here's what I don't want to happen. I don't want us to say we're going to do something and then not show up. So I hope on the way out you'll stop by the table and, and say, hey, how can I help? Which school needs help? And, and go there and spend a couple of hours painting or cleaning. Uh, uh, if you're in a life group, I hope you'll grab your life group and say, hey, let's go do this. We can serve. But see, that's our identity as servants. But more importantly than going and serving our schools is serving our families. I'd rather you serve your family all the time than show up once a year and, and serve our schools. Because that will be a long-term uh, difference. So I was reading, and guess what the number one complaint of wives is, according to that Bastion of Truth Red Book magazine? I, and by the way, I confess I don't read Red Book magazine, but uh, Google uh, quoted them, so I did. Uh, so it's, it's not that he doesn't make enough money. It's not about anything in the bedroom. The number one complaint is he doesn't help enough around the house. Is there an Amen. Oh, how come all those voices sounded feminine? <laughs> so guys, let me just be really blunt. I told you this is really practical. If you want a blessed marriage, if you want a happy wife, do the dishes, clean the toilets, run the vacuum, finish the project. <laughs> Half expected standing ovations from the wives at that point. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, didn't have 0 for 4. Uh, so anyway. See, we laugh about this, but it, it's so simple. It's right there in front of us. We're servants. Let's serve. And it goes both ways. It, it's both spouses looking out for the needs of the other. And again, we have to battle that temptation to be selfish because we're always wanting to be selfish. Jesus calls us to be servants. So words of kindness, acts of service, and an attitude of grace. Attitude of grace. You want to be blessed, you've got to have an attitude of grace. Again, in Ephesians 4, the Apostle Paul says, uh, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. We're to forgive as we've been forgiven, which means completely, totally, uh, always forgiving, because that's how God forgives us. And, and the best place to start with grace is the person who offends you the most, which is obviously your spouse, Right? Because we spend time together. We live together. We share beds and bathrooms. We share food and kids and bills and in-laws. So, of course, we're going to offend each other. It's just part of life. That's why we all desperately need grace. Uh, so let me just challenge you to do something. If you really want an attitude of grace, best way I know to develop it is this. When you wake up in the morning before your feet hit the floor, Pray for your spouse and for yourself. And here's what I want you to pray. God, help me to forgive my spouse before they offend me. I mean, you already know how they're going to offend you. You already know those things they do that are irritating, that drive you crazy, that you would fix in a heartbeat. And, and see, here's the thing. You, when you have an attitude of grace, you stop judging them. You stop pointing out the flaws. You start going, you did this wrong, you did this wrong, you don't do this right. And, and you just start going, hey, you know what? God's forgiven me. I'm going to forgive them. An attitude of grace, and it flows. And, and if you'll do that, and you'll say, okay, God, help me to forgive them before they offend me, and help me to love them like you love me, it, it'll change your attitude. And your attitude begins one, becomes one of grace, and it flavors everything in the relationship. Now, number one, you have to mean it when you pray it, and you have to be consistent praying it. Sometimes you have to pray it all throughout the day because, you know, your spouse might be really annoying. But... Uh, but forgiveness is a huge issue in marriages, so let's be preemptive with forgiveness and grace. It'll change the dynamic of the relationship. And, and if forgiveness is getting in the way uh, of your relationship, ask God to teach you how to forgive. 
he, he'll do that because he delights in forgiveness. So you want to be blessed. Bless your spouse. It'll come back to you. Bless your children. It'll come back to you. Bless your friends. Hey, I'm even going to challenge you to bless your enemies because that's Jesus' way. The more you bless, the more you're going to be blessed. Now, if you're thinking this sounds great, but you don't really know how to do it, uh, again, this is practical. We got help available. So if you've got some personal issues that are getting in the way that are sabotaging you, can I just encourage you to check out Celebrate Recovery Monday, 630 at our McCulloch campus. It's for anyone with hurts, habits, or hang-ups. That's all of us, by the way. And, and it'll help you develop your, as a healthier person. And I love it when husbands and wives both go and they both learn and they both become healthier and they bring healthier selves into the relationship. It's worth the investment. So celebrate recovery. Maybe your marriage is in crisis. Maybe you're sitting here today listening going, yeah, but we're beyond hope. We're beyond redemption. I don't believe that because God can redeem. But if your marriage is in trouble, we've got counseling available. Through the church office, you can call us. And, and also, we've got partnerships with counselors in our community. And we would love to help you get the help you need to salvage your marriage. God can redeem. Don't give up. Just go ahead and say, we need help. Third, maybe your marriage is okay. You're not in crisis. You kind of feel like, hey, it's all right, but it could get better. You'd like it to get better. But you really don't know the concrete steps to take. That's why we started the Marriage Mentoring Ministry. And again, there's a table available out here uh, through this door after the service. You can stop by, get some information, talk about it. Uh, and we need both people who want to be mentors because you got a strong, healthy marriage and you've survived and God's redeemed and you want to bless some others. And we also are inviting people who say, hey, I want someone to encourage us. I want somebody that we can learn from. I want somebody we can just ask really ridiculous questions of and not feel embarrassed. You can sign up online, calvarylhc.com. You go to the ministries part, you have to pull on down the menu and it'll say marriage ministries. You can sign up online and they will connect you to a mentor couple. That's how this works. No pressure, no publicity. It's just you and another couple. You get together, you talk. So that's what we have. We have help available to you. We're already praying for you. We're already encouraging you. We're already having sermon series where we're talking about this stuff because we want you to talk about this stuff. Don't just say that you want a better marriage. Submit to Jesus and follow him and let him build it in your life. That's what he wants to do. I pray that you will let him do that. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for adopting us as children. Thank you for putting your spirit in us to teach us and lead us. And right now we need to hear your voice. We need to get some courage uh, because you're prompting us to take some actions that are honestly unnerving, to have some conversations with our spouses, to seek some counsel from people who uh, are a little bit further down the road. So God, help us to follow through with your leading right now. And I just pray that every person here would hear your voice, would know that you love them, and would have hope because you can redeem. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.